A very good afternoon to you all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're connecting from. Welcome to the World Day Taking in Persons uh, 2024 commemoration, where together we are joining the world to, under the theme, leave no child behind in the fight against human trafficking. This webinar, we are focusing on state responsibility to prevent and protect women and girls from sex trafficking. My name is Sally Nube. I'm from Equality Now, and we are co-hosting this webinar with Life Bloom Services International, Trace Kenya, and people saving girls at risk. So today I'll be the moderator for the convening that we gather here today. We are excited that you have joined us on board. Please utilize the chat box to introduce yourself, which part of the world you are connecting to, uh, and some of the things that come into your mind when you look into how is how is it that we can actually work together, any ideas around ending sex trafficking for women and girls. So the objectives of today's webinar is we are focusing on one, raising awareness of human trafficking, it's a gendered human rights violation. The second one, we are also looking forward to us raising awareness, learning and unlearning together on the extent and root causes of sex trafficking in Africa. And then we together discuss on opportunities and examples of good practices in addressing sex trafficking, as well as some of the strategies that we can consider and explore together uh, in our respective mandates and collectively together towards cultivating political will of state actors, civil society actors, regional human rights actors, so that together they can work together for the role to solve systemic issues and create uh, uh, systemic issues that create an enabling environment for vulnerabilities of women and girls to sex trafficking. So this webinar will be mostly in English, uh, and we are excited and we know that you'll be accessing that. So should you have any questions, please utilize the chat box so that we will move together collectively. So to get us started, allow me to invite Sitsima Tekaire, who is uh, our global lead for ending sexual violence. Sitsi, there you are. Please take us through the background to this webinar. Over to you, Sitsi. Thank you for making time. Um, thank you uh, so much, Sally. Um, and thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us on this webinar. Um, I also want to thank our panelists, uh, who are experts from Equality Now's partner organizations, as well as UNODC, uh, for being part of this webinar. Equality Now's mission is to achieve legal and systemic change that addresses violence and discrimination against women and girls around the world, including to end uh, sexual exploitation. Um, so on this day's, uh, on, on this year's World Day Against Trafficking in Persons, with the theme of leaving no child behind in the fight against human trafficking, uh, we just wanted to spend this time to spotlight the growing challenge of sex trafficking, its impact on, on girls and on women, and more importantly, to focus on what the solutions may look like and hear from local organizations as well as uh, the UNODC about ongoing efforts to engage governments and duty bearers uh, to prevent and address it. Um, throughout our work um, at Equality Now with our partners around the world, and we'll hear from some of them today, we know that sex trafficking is present in all regions, even if it's manifesting in different ways, and that it is the predominant form of trafficking in persons globally. Uh, globally, one in every three people that are trafficked are children, boys estimated at 17% and girls at 18%. And we also know that the majority of girls are trafficked for sexual exploitation. Globally, more than 50% of detected trafficking victims are trafficked for sexual exploitation, 77% of uh, women and 72% of girls who are trafficked are actually trafficked for sexual exploitation. And sex trafficking remains one of the most profitable forms of human trafficking uh, for traffickers who are raking in huge profits every year in the global commercial sex industry. Uh, when we look regionally within Sub-Saharan Africa, according to UNODC's global report on trafficking in persons of 2022, 
uh, within sub-Saharan Africa, more children than adults continue to be detected as victims of uh, trafficking. In particular, girls were the most detected in 2020, although we also see a growing number of boys who are also being detected. And this is similar to other regions where women and girls make up the largest share of victims, accounting for 62% of the total within sub-Saharan Africa. Um, international law prohibits slavery and sla slavery like practices under different treaties that have been enforced for many years, for more than a century. And in the last decades, we have seen the UN also adopting or governments adopting the Palermo Protocol. Uh, yet sex trafficking remains one of the prevailing challenges for the international community with criminal enterprises that traffic in women and girls flourishing with the rise of the commercial sex trade that, uh, that has created and normalized um, the demand and the lucrative uh, market for traffickers. Um, we also know that whilst anyone can be a victim of uh, sex trafficking, people that are facing multiple and intersecting inequalities and discrimination are predominantly uh, impacted due to the uh, vulnerabilities that are created. These inequalities include living in poverty, lack of viable economic and livelihood choices, discrimination and exclusion that is based on sex, um, on gender, disability, class, sexual, sexual orientation, and, and so on. And we know that particularly for, for women and girls, right from birth, girls have to navigate systems in which most boys are more privileged. This could be in education, in the family, in politics, in law enforcement, and institutions generally, and society at large. And this really results in lower education, higher chances of child marriage, um, limited economic opportunities, all of this, which makes them much more particularly vulnerable to sex trafficking. So at Equality Now, with our local partners around the world, we are advocating that governments put in place legislative and other measures to ensure substantive equality in the law and in practice for women and girls, and to address gender inequality and discrimination in line with international human rights law and standards. We believe that this is really fundamental to preventing uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation. And we know as well that even, even though the vulnerability is there, women and girls are not trafficked just because they are vulnerable, but because there's a, there's a market and a demand for it. There's someone who's willing to buy sex. So traffickers, those who buy sex and other exploiters are basically abusing their positions of vulnerability to exploit girls with impunity. So governments also need to be looking at addressing the demand side as part of the prevention. Um, so I'll end here and um, looking forward as well to hearing from our partners in terms of some of the work that they are doing to prevent uh, sex trafficking and to address it and how they're engaging uh, with governments and local actors within their communities um, to prevent and address uh, sexual exploitation. Thank you and back to you, Sally. Thank you, Tsitsi. Thank you, everyone. I see you are checking in. Let's continue to use the chat box for you to check in with us into the webinar. Kindly introduce yourself through the chat box and which part of the world you are connecting from and your organization. So we are now transitioning to a panel discussion where we link, learn, uh, and unlearn, and also pick some of the, from the reflections um, and celebrate the gains and the hard work from some of our partners. Uh, on the panel, I'll start with inviting Paul uh, from Trace Kenya. Uh, Paul, kindly self introduce yourself and in 10 minutes, uh, share with us the situation in Kenya, some of the work you are doing, lessons and experiences you have had in engaging state, state actors. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Sally. My name is Paul Adoch. I'm the executive director at Trace Kenya. I've been working in the counter traffic in person sphere for the last uh, 18 years. Uh, I'm one of the founder members of Trace Kenya and currently the executive director since uh, 2013. Now, I wish to just discuss a bit of what we at Trace Kenya are working on uh, with regard to specifically dealing with child trafficking and specific regard with uh, 
uh, sexual exploitation of uh, of girls, uh, women and girls, but specifically with girls. So we have at the moment uh, five programs that deal specifically with uh, fighting uh, trafficking, and I'll and I'll kind of wish to uh, you allow me just to mention them, then I'll discuss them briefly uh, uh, with you. The first one is a project that is uh, seeking to prevent violence against children. Uh, and we know that on the ground, there is different forms of violence meted against children. And girls, of course, face uh, the, the bigger burden of violation, uh, particularly the sexual violation. Uh, boys uh, and um, young people, adolescents, uh, male adolescents do not Uh, it goes around to support children, particularly in uh, parenting, uh, for them so that they can be prevented from uh, being victims of violence. Our second program is we're working with partners uh, and, and uh, uh, college now support through the judicial system to seek to address obstacles in uh, seeking justice for victims of trafficking and victims of sexual violence and exploitation. Again, we have to work with the, within the COC or the court users committees to try and address some of the obstacles that they face. In numerous cases, there's a huge number of children that face sexual violation. A huge majority of them, again, are girls. We, got, we have a project that we support children in education, you know, uh, this through a Hungarian partner. So we call it Africa Born in My Heart project. And this project seeks to support children who are at very high risk being victims of sexual exploitation. We do have both men and uh, male and female, but majority of, of, of them again are girls. Uh, they, are, they fall within our project. We offer them a bit of mentorship and we follow them up through school and offer continuous stay within the school cycle in which case then they'll not be easily lured into sexual exploitation. Finally, we have an advocacy project that we work with in order to seek the bigger uh, discussions on structural violence against women and girls. Again, we are tackling issues related to girls. And this means then that we are trying to work as change agents in circumstances where girls right from birth are um, mentally prepared for issues that relate to them becoming victims of trafficking, particularly for sexual exploitation. Now, these projects are, are set, set within the following realms. The first project is basically a parenting project. You know, parent respectability is the name of the, the main focus of the project. And we know that in many cases within our setup, uh, parents play a part in in helping their children to become or enabling their children to become victims of sexual exploitation. This is because aspects of sexual exploitation, particularly transactional sex, is normalized and acceptable, uh, both at familial level and within the community. So our project seeks to ensure that this does not continue, that mindsets are changed, uh, that communities start addressing those uh, aspects of exploitation that particularly are burdensome to girls. The second one is basically mentorship that we work closely again with them uh, through the generosity of the the generosity of the girl trust fund. And fund supports us to remove those who have lived experiences of sexual exploitation. And over the years we work with them. Uh, this being the eighth, the seventh year, so to speak, that we've worked with girls and actively remove them from the pains, victims of sexual exploitation or prostituted children. And we, we've made sure that over the years, without judging them, without uh, any form of, uh, any form of um, indicating in any way that we, we're judging their lives or situations in life, we slowly try to help them to take the first initial steps and then later on bold steps to move away from violation. Indeed, um, I can report to you that perhaps it's one of the most difficult ways to get a child basically rehabilitated from sexual exploitation, partly because of the circumstances where they continue to live, but also partly because of the uh, 
the heavy stigma and the, you know, the fact that for a very long time they've been victims of sexual exploitation and internalize it as an aspect of a normal life. Nonetheless, we've had some success stories and a number of our girls have slowly walked out of uh, the lived experience of sexual exploitation. And now at least they are aware that what they go through is not on their own volition, but is a structural setup that, that is at the end of the day, exploitative to them. We then do have uh, the work that we work with the judiciary that I just mentioned earlier. In, in this case, we do understand that uh, the judicial service system under the court users committee encapsulate all players within the judicial services. And some of these players include the police, the directorate of children's services, the magistrates. And so as a big team, we're able to address and look at those obstacles that make it difficult for girls who face defilements and boys who've been sodomized, finding it difficult to get uh, justice. Uh, ordinarily, again, you'll, you'll find that when the matter affects uh, girls, though they are very good laws, families seek to, uh, to deal with these matters out of court. Let me then briefly just say, what are the drivers of some of the problems that we, that we have here? Uh, it's, it's very easy to say that the easiest driver is uh, you know, poverty, the lack of opportunities for our children. But uh, over the years, we've realized that besides that, there are also other drivers that uh, lead to that. One is aspirational living where sex uh, as a form of life or as a way of life is acceptable and normalized within the community and therefore children are, are easily led into it early in life and be victims of the same along their and they become victims of the same and imagined enablers of the same. Uh, one of the biggest current enablers is um, the use of ICT, uh, uh, online driven sexual exploitation or luring of the victims through the online platform. So this this great enabler, and it, it's it's become more so because the predators feel much much safer and more and more young people find themselves within the, that same sphere. Of course, the other enabler is and the go. negative aspects of. You have two minutes Thank you. to go. The other enabler, yeah, I got you. Thank you. The other enabler is the tourist. Um, uh, you know, our coastal region is a tourist destination, and therefore, uh, by its own uh, nature, the negative aspects become a big enabler. The agents then become the beach boys and the community in general, and perpetrators are increasingly not just foreigners, but equally Kenyans and uh, Eastern Africans. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul, for sharing, uh, you know, your experience and the amazing work that you are doing to safeguard, protect, prevent, and respond uh, to issues and ensure that you play your part as uh, Tres Kenya. Now we move on to Eunice. Eunice, still on Kenyan experience from your work, uh, kindly share. Uh, and we get to learn from your experiences on the drivers and some of the things and your experiences around engaging state actors uh, and lessons that you have had. Eunice, over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Eunice. I don't know, I don't know whether you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Briefly introduce yourself, your organization, and share your experience. Thank you. Hi, Eunice. We can't hear you now. Kindly unmute and proceed to make your contribution. All right. Thank you. Yes, now I can. I can be able to unmute. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Eunice Miner. I work at Life Bloom Services International. 
I am here representing Catherine Wanjohi, our CEO, who is also inside the room, and she has got a flu, but she's not able to communicate very well. And that's why I am present, uh, presenting on her behalf. Thank you very much. Uh, for the for Life Bloom, we work to support vulnerable women and girls and children, especially the survivors of sex trafficking and sexual exploitation and other forms of trafficking. And uh, for us, we would say that our experience that we have been working with the women and girls, it has been quite a, a challenge, especially the, due to the increase and in the emerging issues of the sex trafficking. And some of the drivers, as uh, the previous previous panelists have mentioned, they are the drivers, especially the issues of lack of education and lack of uh, opportunities, particularly for the girls, which we found where we found that they, we find out that the girls they are not able to make the choices. They are and thus they are being more vulnerable to sex trafficking, and thus find they find themselves in situations that they are not even able to even understand that they are even being exploited or being sex, sex, sexually exploited, yes. The other one is also the issue of cultural practices here in Naivasha and uh, the larger Nakuru County and the narrow counties where we have been working. The cultural practices and gender inequality, we have a cosmopolitan town that we have got different and mixed cultures that has deep-rooted uh, deep, deep patriarchal norms where early marriages, female genital mutilation, thus increasing the risk of sex trafficking. The other issue, the other driver is also the demand for commercial sex. Uh, in Naivasha, we know that it is a town, but majority of us know that it is a town that is full of life, full of life in terms of uh, the, the tourism, the Airbnbs, the World Rally Championships on the Safari Rally. We also have other events such as the Koroga Festival and also the hotel industry is very high. Thus, it, also, it has also been a driver contributing towards the sex trafficking. Uh, the enablers and the agents of, the enablers and agents of, and perpetrators of sex trafficking, we have got families that are, due to the vulnerabilities that we have mentioned, the poverty, you find out that even some of the women, and especially the category that you work with, the pro prostituted women, you find that they they send the girls, some of the girls, even their daughters, to the to the streets and that they can be able to bring some money, they can be able to bring something in the, in the family for livelihood. The other thing is also, the other enabler is the brother owners and the managers of some of the hotels. The individual, these individuals, you find out that they profit from the exploitation, or exploitation of the trafficked persons by, by where they get these people, the people that are coming in and the brother owners, they are, you find out that they are not able to, to say no to some of these vices. The other thing is also the, demand for commercial sex the clients you find that do that or oh, in Naivasha we can be able to get this and they are the, because of the the lifestyle that is there we can be able to get the the, the commercial sex and uh life bloom what we have been we have been doing through to address the issues of the sex trafficking our work is anchored on the four pillars the four pillars where we are, we are anchored, our work is we are anchored on protection, prevention, persecution, and partnerships. And how we work on the issues of protection is that we are working in partnership with the stakeholders, the community at the ground, because at the end of the day, the girls belong to the community. And that's where we are now partnering with the, with the Department of the Children's Services, the charitable institutions, charitable children institutions that we can be able to play some of the girls that are at risk and some of the survivors of sex, sex trafficking. We also offer education, education support to the girls and the women, not just the girls, because even for the women, we have got a module, five, uh, five step module that trains the women that they can be able to get some other skills so that they can be able to earn a, a livelihood. We also offer provision of counseling services, counseling services, trauma counseling services to the children and the women, the survivors, 
and also la from last year we have been working in partnership with the CUC, the, that is the Court Users Committee, where we have been built capacity building the Court Users Committee on the matters of sex trafficking and the national referral mechanisms. Uh, the other aspect that we utilize is as the girl clubs or the champions for change, where we are working with the schools to be able to, to be, where we have the some of the girls and the survivors and we build their capacity that they can be able to, to they can be able to lead other girls and they can be able to share their experiences and also be able to equip other girls on issues of their sex trafficking through the, that this is done through the one of our models of the peer mentor models where we focus on the, on training and building the capacities of the peers we also have been working closely with both the national government and the county government where we have been working closely with the Nakuru County government on matters inclusion of prostituted women and girls and then those that are at risk especially in the development of the Nakuru County gender policy where the include the prostituted women were, able, were were included in that in the development of that policy they were able to share their views their issues and issues that affect them uh, also something that Life Bloom has been able to do <laughs> sorry is that we have been working in collaboration with other CSOs and other partners such as the Equality Now, the UNODC, the Global Initiative, the GIZ and the Kenyan government on issues on matters of trafficking and also we have been able to engage state, state actors through capacity building on matter sex trafficking. We have been working closely with the CUC through the support from the Equality Now. Uh, what lessons we have been able, we can be able to share with other CSOs in Kenya and beyond is that uh, CSOs working to combat sex trafficking it's that we can be able to share as peers, both domestically and internationally. And to address sex trafficking in Kenya and beyond, Life Bloom would recommend that CSOs, CSOs should reprioritize survivor-centered care and holistic services. The CSOs should focus on community involvement and data-driven work because these girls and women belong to a community. Uh, the other recommendation we would have is that CSOs need to advocate for policy change and effective media engagement. And also the last one, but not the least, CSOs should ensure sustainability and innovation in the programs addressing sex trafficking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eunice, uh, for making it in time and for the great work that you are doing with your organization. Now we move from Kenya to Malawi, uh, where we invite Caleb uh, from People Saving Girls at Risk, so that, uh, Caleb, you can share from the Malawi experience. Uh, what have been your experiences? What have been the lessons? And what are some of the recommendations? Over to you, Caleb. Um... Thank you so much, moderator. I don't know if uh, everyone can hear me, um, but my name is uh, Caleb Ngombo, uh, as introduced by the moderator, and I'm the executive director of a local organization in Malawi called People Saving Girls at Risk. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be sharing my experiences and speak to the situation of uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation in Malawi. Uh, I also talk about the impact of uh, the cyclones uh, and other climate-related crises on uh, uh, girls' vulnerability to sex trafficking. Um, I also talk about uh, our advocacy for the equality model uh, approach uh, to law in Malawi and how we see it as an opportunity uh, to prevent and respond to um, trafficking for sexual exploitation. I don't know, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Ken. Okay, okay. And lastly, I also talk about how uh, I think CSOs uh, and other state actors uh, can work together uh, to advocate for effective implementation uh, of laws and uh, policies. So I begin by unpacking the situation of trafficking in Malawi. Uh, let me say uh, that Malawi signed the Parima Protocol uh, we have the Trafficking in Persons Act, 
but we also have uh, uh, the constitution which identifies uh, a child as someone below uh, the age of 18. And so uh, regardless of uh, these and other other protocols, uh, the child protection uh, law, uh, and the numerous numerous other policies. Uh, nearly every day, uh, we still receive reports of children being trafficked uh, for purposes of commercial sexual exploitation, forced labor, and to a smaller extent, uh, for purposes of uh, organ harvesting. We do have cases of organ harvesting. Um, yeah. Often frequently, we also uh, receive reports of girls and boys under the age of 18 uh, being recruited uh, to work as domestic servants. And lately, we have also uh, been receiving reports uh, about children uh, being recruited in the production of uh, uh, pornography. Uh, all this uh, amounts to uh, trafficking. Um, but as we all know, um, Complex cultural factors, which include beliefs about children's roles, attitudes uh, towards uh, child labor, uh, that they have to be uh, heading goats and cows, uh, the gender roles, uh, and education, all too often uh, put children at risk of uh, trafficking. Um, the vulnerability of children who are not in school, those who are orphaned, uh, children exposed to harmful cultural practices, mainly those who undergo initiation ceremonies uh, and experience sexual violence acts such as dust, uh, dust cleansing, hyena or kubimbila. Uh, these are some of the harmful cultural practices um, that unfortunately children in Malawi are subjected to uh, by virtue of um, uh, say coming of age. And so you are supposed to undergo an uh, initiation ceremony uh, where you are taught all sorts of things, all sorts of requirements, all sorts of uh, expectations uh, from you as an adult. And at the end of the ceremony, when you are graduating uh, in some cultures, they expect you uh, to sleep with either a boy uh, or a man uh, to cleanse off the college, to cleanse off the dust that you have accumulated uh, during the initiation. Or uh, you also have to sleep with someone who is not known to you. Uh, and in that context, it's known as uh, a hyena. All these are heightening um, uh, the trafficking uh, of girls. We also see uh, girls below the age of 18 trafficked for forced marriages. Uh, sadly, uh, within uh, within the borders of Malawi and uh, outside the borders of Malawi, uh, we've had cases of um, uh, uh, girls uh, being taken by um, uh, truckers uh, or truck drivers uh, through Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and uh, and uh, to South Africa. Um, in fact, in South Africa, uh, there's a town they call it uh, Malawi Village. Okay, um, yeah, uh, think as as we go to uh, to Cape Town. So, but it's done for uh, forced uh, marriages, and unfortunately, they're below the age of uh, eighteen. As an organization, uh, we're working in uh, communities to uh, raise awareness, to spotlight on uh, child trafficking and sex trafficking, but also to highlight how sex trafficking uh, manifests itself. There's lack of understanding uh, of what sex trafficking is, or if indeed um, uh, yeah. in some communities uh, where awareness has not uh, filtered to a large extent, people still arguing, uh, believing that uh, there's nothing uh, like, like, like child trafficking. So it is always important. Uh, that we illuminate light on it, we highlight it, and especially uh, we demystify how uh, it manifests itself. It is also important to note that uh, pandemics and uh, climate-related natural disasters also contribute very significantly to exacerbating the vulnerability of girls uh, to trafficking. When such disasters happened, uh, for example, the second Friday, we could clearly see uh, the family and the community social uh, protection systems disintegrating and in the process exposing uh, children to uh, traffickers. Uh, sadly, the impact of the COVID-19, uh, the second Friday, as I mentioned, and other natural disasters remain far reaching. They have heightened, like I said, um, uh, the levels of uh, poverty, 
dis disintegrated uh, family and community social protection systems and have left many girls and children out of school. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we also hear from the, uh, the World Food Program in Malawi are revealing that we now have more households affected by hunger and malnutrition. Uh, all these factors are a precursor uh, to uh, children uh, being vulnerable uh, to trafficking. I also must uh, note uh, that cases of uh, online recruitment are increasing exponentially uh, due to the migration uh, from the conventional uh, to technology platforms of learning, which came as a result of the uh, lockdowns uh, during the, the time of COVID. Um, I will not labor myself to talk about uh, the other uh, push factors, uh, because I think my sister from uh, from Broome, Kenya, uh, but also Mze, uh, Paul, um, Ado, I, I think they have, they have highlighted all of them. Um, but maybe most importantly, let me uh, talk about what I think uh, we as CSOs or non-state state actors could uh, come in to contribute to uh, national efforts or global efforts uh, to ending child trafficking. So we do think CSOs and other non-state actors all exist to complement uh, government efforts. And we are a mechanism uh, to enhance states' accountability. Uh, as such, CSOs must always come in uh, come together and collaborate from uh, one end to engage governments uh, to account for their commitments in protecting all children uh, from uh, from trafficking. And this must not be done with any distinctions. Um, everyone, everyone, everyone must just be uh, protected from uh, from from trafficking. That is an obligation of the state. Uh, CSOs must also um, uh, use available opportunities at various levels. For example, making statements uh, on global events such as this one, which uh, uh, whose whose commemoration we've started today, uh, and the epitome is tomorrow, uh, the World Day Against Trafficking, uh, to remind our governments to prioritize, strengthen, and implement laws and policies which protect children from uh, from trafficking. Again, as say so, um, we can also utilize and engage uh, regional mechanisms established to uh, hold states uh, accountable uh, to addressing systemic and gender discrimination of women and girls uh, in our countries. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the best uh, case studies that I would share uh, in our is our collaboration with uh, Equality Now, where we have engaged advocacy with the African Union. Uh, through the African Committee uh, of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of Children on a case of tra uh, sex trafficking of a minor from a particular rural area uh, in Malawi. So the teamwork that, that we are uh, experiencing is just a phenomenal, and we are also uh, much hoping for a, an outcome that benefits uh, millions of children uh, in Malawi, not, not, not just uh, uh, this particular girl. We also think uh, CSOs must collaborate to engage uh, uh, government uh, governments uh, for improved uh, service provision, such as availability of uh, shelters and qualified personnel uh, to provide psychosocial counseling, vocational skills, and reintegration. I think uh, my sister from Kenya alluded to this fact, where they are providing psychosocial counseling. But that must be done uh, in confines of uh, mm -hmm. uh, safe spaces. And how do you ensure safe spaces if you do not have uh, shelters, if you do not have uh, qualified personnel, if you do not have um, uh, uh, adequate adequate resources? <clears throat> and mostly we are advocating uh, for this to be a state-run state run shelters, okay? Because we, organizations, like I said, we only exist to complement uh, government's efforts. And our funding uh, may be there for a specific specific, uh, specific period of time, but governments, that's their core duty. Okay, that's their core duty. So they must ensure that um, uh, uh, they have uh, state-run shelters like this. And we as civil society must come in to always push push government, engage government to, uh, to ensure that um, uh, they establish a, a such, such uh, shelters. Also engage uh, policy makers to ensure that survivors uh, are given- Can I still uh, wrap up your time up, Caleb? My time is up. Okay, can I just quickly talk about the Nordic model uh, law? 
uh, uh, that we are trying to advocate for. And so uh, the, the Nordic model law, or which is also known as uh, the Swedish model law because it uh, originated uh, in Sweden, um, uh, is a, an approach uh, that stewards uh, prostitution uh, on a continuum of uh, male violence against women. Uh, we believe uh, prostitution uh, benefits men uh, more than women themselves. Uh, and in the recent report by the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls, uh, the Special Rapporteur recognizes prostitution as a system of exploitation and an aggregated form of you know, violence against women and girls. And so what we are doing as an organization is to engage uh, members of parliament uh, to visit the brothels so that they can have first-hand experiences of the harrowing stories, the harrowing uh, treatment that uh, prostituted women are going through. Uh, at the same time, we are also trying to engage them uh, to come up with specific laws that will eventually uh, effectively uh, protect women and girls, especially uh, uh, children, because at the moment they can still uh, 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 get uh, get lost through the cracks of uh, just justice, as there's no specific law that talks about pimping, uh, brothels, and, and what have you. So all that we think uh, is an important uh, uh, a piece uh, of the puzzle that we must solve in order to effectively, effectively uh, protect everyone uh, from, from sex trafficking. Thank you very much, Caleb. Um, now we move on to our partner, and as we continue commemorating the World Day Against Trafficking in Persons 2024, so annually this day is commemorated on the 30th of June, and as equality now with the partners, we have just cho chosen to do it today. So now we move on um, to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, and here we have been joined by Silke Albert, who has worked on human trafficking, migrant smuggling, and related issues since 2001, both for international uh, or inter intergovernmental organizations at global level, uh, grassroots networks, uh, CSOs, and she currently works with the human trafficking and migrant smuggling section on the United Nations Organ on Drugs and Crime. So Silke, uh, the theme for this year is Leaving No Child Behind. And uh, as the UNDOC, you have uh, grown in expertise in solidarity and technical support. So today, as we gather in commemoration and to refine our collective action and learn, um, what are some of the trends and opportunities emerging? And how have been UNDOC supporting uh, government and CSO efforts to address sex trafficking specifically, and any opportunities that exist. Over to you, Silke, when you're ready. Thank you very much, Sally. And thanks for the invitation. And let me start up by saying that uh, I, I think this is an excellent event and, and really urgently, urgently needed. Um, generally speaking, the last global report on human trafficking that UNODC issues every two years, and the next one will come out by the end of this year, showed quite a number of worrying trends. One is that female victims continue to be the most detected among those trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation. Nearly two thirds of detected victims of uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation are women and another 27% are girls. And Siti said it already, children continue to make up one third of victims detected globally with huge variations in different regions. So it can even be uh, more than one third. And it seems that um, for the upcoming global report, so by the end of this year, it will be even a bigger share than, than one third of all victims being children. And we heard a little bit already from previous speakers about the impact of COVID and globally we see this as well. Um, so we saw that the number of victims identified globally fell by 11% uh, in, in 2021 compared to 2019. 
and that's the the biggest ever drop because for years we tend to make progress even as as little as it may be but we tend to make progress in the identification uh, investigation uh, and and adjudication prosecution of cases and this this time it fell and of course this also affects the detection of uh, child victims and it's a 24% reduction uh, uh, of uh, identified victims compared to 2019 for sexual exploitation. So even a, a little bit more. And then one trend that we see is that um, victims very much self-rescue, uh, uh, which is the case for more than 40% of all victims. Again, imagine what this could mean for children and when we say self-rescue, I mean, in best, it could be that um, victims who self-identify as victims of trafficking find such perfect systems in place that it's easy for them to self-identify. But we know reality is very different. So in fact, victims self-identify against all odds so to say, against all obstacles and, and, and everything that makes them actually not to self-identify. So imagine, and here I, I would really like to echo uh, the webinar's theme, and that is preventing trafficking and protecting victims is a core state responsibility, uh, no matter the contributions that civil society makes and needs to make, it is a state responsibility. Um, another trend that we've seen is that women and children suffer greater violence at the hands of traffickers uh, and female victims are subjected to physical or extreme violence at the hands of traffickers at a rate three times higher than males and children are subjected to physical or extreme violence at a rate almost two times higher than adults. And an analysis of the case summaries collected by UNODC suggests that traffickers use more violence with women and children, especially girls. Um, since you asked about the trends, I mean, and it has been mentioned before, and it may perhaps again be a trend that has been uh, uh, increased, exacerbated by, by, by COVID, the growing use of the internet and technology has also and continues to change the landscape of human trafficking, particularly in relation to children. Traffickers have instant access to a vast pool of potential victims and can control and exploit children online without any physical contact. So that's an ideal environment for online sexual exploitation. And we see it that indeed it is called online sexual exploitation of children, um, which is not a problem at all, but we, we, we tend to see that it's treated like a separate issue from trafficking in children and me and my team, we start looking more into that because when you have grooming, uh, you have recruitment, and when you have recruitment for the purpose of exploitation, sexual exploitation, uh, sexual exploitation of girls, you have trafficking. Um, why is it important? We have to think about that. Is it important to identify these cases of as uh, trafficking cases, we think it is because of um, uh, the, the protection, the rights to protection, the rights to assistance, the non-punishment in case that uh, that becomes relevant in any form. So there are a lot of advantages having cases looked as, as trafficking in persons cases. Um, how are we as UNODC supporting, supporting efforts um, so we have a, a program uh, called uh, End Violence Against Children, and that has um, supported a call to action that is currently supported by more than 70 member states. 
uh, to remove child sexual exploitation and abuse material online. Um, and that's quite, quite important. Um, I also, um, I just responding to what uh, Caleb, or should I say my brother from Malawi said, um, just mentioned on Malawi, for example, UNODC supported efforts to raise awareness on trafficking, trafficking for sexual exploitation, child trafficking, etc., among truck drivers. Um, and I think that effort has been has been very much appreciated. Uh, in general, uh, UNODC supports in in different directions. So one is uh, uh, what we call normative work. Uh, that is supporting the intergovernmental processes. Uh, the most known intergovernmental uh, and UN bodies is probably uh, the General Assembly, Security Council, but there are other bodies as well. Uh, one that is based in, in, in Vienna, where we have our headquarters, is uh, the Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Commission. Um, and also here in Vienna takes place uh, what is called the Conference of the Parties. So the parties to the to the Palermo Protocol, um, and they they meet in Vienna and they have established what is called a a working group uh, on trafficking in persons. Um, and the working group has established a constructive dialogue uh, with civil society. So uh, this is where civil society uh, meets the constructive, uh, the, the working group on trafficking in persons where governments exchange on the progress made in implementing uh, the protocol. And of course that voice is very much needed because if you listen to governments only, you may get the feeling that we almost solved problems around human trafficking. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course, because the working group is really beautiful for states to exchange also challenges they face. Um, so normative, and we also have a, a, a model law on uh, trafficking in persons. Um, on the issue of prostitution, we are neutral because the protocol is but with children, of course, that's different. There is nothing like child pornography. There is nothing like child prostitution, but exploitation of children uh, in, in, in prostitution and in pornography. And we, we, we are really very careful with our language here. And even if we are neutral on the, is, on the issue of prostitution of adults, um, we are not neutral in, in the sense of protecting uh, women and we are not neutral in promoting the non-punishment clause uh, and the protection of victims of of traffickers of traffic oh no no not of traffickers of uh, victims of trafficking uh, and survivors. So uh, um, another another part of our work is uh, technical cooperation. Uh, we do work with member states based on requests. So we always do it um, not like entering a country by force, but based on a particularly request for assistance. And we work with member states either uh, to build structures, to, to develop action plans, national action plans, uh, to build structures, especially within the criminal justice, like and, and also law enforcement, like with police, uh, setting up special investigative units or, 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 or training specialized prosecutors, um, and also uh, working with, uh, with judges, um, uh, providing assistance, um, workshops, and, and we always do that hand in hand with uh, uh, civil society organizations because, again, it's a, it's a state responsibility, but, but normally victims of trafficking trust uh, uh, civil society actors much more than states state actors, and in many cases, actually, sadly, rightly so, um, because of uh, corruption and, 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 and other issues. Um, so this is um, technical cooperation. And then we also uh, work to develop tools 
um, and that's from manuals to we plan to have a tool uh, to develop a tool over the next three years on um, a better like a, a model memorandum of understanding between law enforcement and civil society uh, to help to reduce mistrust and help to build transparency of each other's um, field of expertise uh, and, and other tools. And then I sit in the very newly created child trafficking survivor engagement and partnerships team. So we want to give um, survivor engagement a much higher standing and, and, and starting with looking within UNODC, uh, what can we improve and how can we provide opportunities and how can we reach out. Uh, without necessarily hurting survivors, because that's what we very often did. We as the UN community, like just dragging out survivors to speak at different events, but then not, not engaging in a more meaningful manner. And the changes and the changes for a lot of UN agencies. Um, and then also in turn, like, like, like also advise member states, governments, how can they engage with survivors? In, in, in ethical and meaningful manners. Um, we also um, coordinate uh, um, an interagency coordination group that is called ICAT. It gathers different UN agencies, but also regional uh, groups um, and other actors around uh, trafficking in persons. It's called Interagency Coordination Group Against Trafficking in Persons, ICAT. Um, and ICAT has issued a call to action to prevent and end child trafficking. Um, and, uh, and, and UNODC is, is, is supporting that and different uh, activities are done. For example, the, the Special Representative Against Violence Against Children um, uh, is working on uh, on uh, on a graphic illustration of what child trafficking is, etc. To for for us to be understood also among among children. Um, so I mentioned the constructive dialogue uh, in the framework of the working group. I can share the link in the chat. Uh, the last uh, constructive dialogue took place from eight to twelve July uh, uh, this year. Um, and and actually, the working group was on child trafficking. I think the next working group is taking place next year in October. Um, and, and it would be great if if many uh, civil society organizations could register. Uh, I suppose that the meeting will be again in hybrid format but there is also limited funding to support the physical travel of uh, civil society organizations um, to participate in person in Vienna in these, in these dialogues. I mean, the basis for all of that is of course the Palermo Protocol and it does mention, and we should not forget that, it does mention the cooperation of states with civil society it may mention it in the weakest possible forms, like to the extent possible and within existing frameworks, etc. But it does require states to make an effort, and that is mandatory. And that is um, to cooperate with NGOs and civil society, both in the field of protection and assistance, but also aiming at the recovery of victims, but also at the prevention of uh, trafficking in persons. And one thing that I would like to mention is that, so my office is planning uh, to, to set up a, a conference, uh, a global survivor forum um, that is to take place in June next year. Uh, so June, 2025. Um, and we, um, we see it as an opportunity between survivors, survivor-led organizations, uh, survivor activists, to connect with uh, other elements of civil society, civil society service providers, uh, but perhaps also with, uh, with states 
and also we we would want the forum to develop recommendations that UNODC could then help to promote in international fora, for example, also uh, promote in the lead up to the appraisal of the Global Plan of Action. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your attention. There is so much more to say always, but I'm looking forward to our to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silke. We celebrate your leadership and passion. We could see it coming. Uh, kindly share, uh, as you have committed through the chat box, uh, some of the links that you were making reference to. Colleagues, we continue again commemorating the World Day against trafficking in persons, and uh, it's uh, for tomorrow. But we have just started it on a good night, on a, on a good light. Um, thank you. I can see you know us joining from Sierra Leone, Kenya, France, Nigeria, Malawi, France. Again, Italy, Zimbabwe, Philippines. Um, it's quite uh, exciting having you on board. Now we are opening for plenary. I can see Gaudens uh, and Anita have shared in some questions um, to, to, through the chat box. So let's continue utilizing the chat box to contribute to the conversation and to also ask questions. You can direct them specifically to any of the panelists, and we will give them time to respond. Um, and those who want to speak to their contribution, please do raise your hands, uh, and we will together have a moment of plenary. Gaudens, would you like to speak to your question? The question that have come from Gaudens, is, are you able to unmute from your end? Uh, Fariha, I can't see if Gaudens can contribute um, in person. Yes, I did. Ah, thank I you. Did. Kindly <laughs> proceed to share your question. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to participate in this um, inspirational session. Um, I'm specifically uh, talking from Rwanda, uh, Organization of Women with Disabilities. And I really appreciated um, sharing from Kenya, from Malawi. Uh, when it comes to girls trafficking um, in relation to sexual uh, harassment, I was thinking about different types of disabilities, hearing and speaking impairment, visual impairment, the, how they are the most at high risk of that kind of trafficking. And I wanted just to hear more uh, from the partner what are the strategies are they using to make sure that those girls with specific needs are, um, are also uh, protected from uh, traffic, human trafficking? Thank you. Thank you, Gaudens. Um, over to you, panelists. We'll start with um, Paul and Eunice. Any or any panelists who have worked directly um, on the question that Gaudens have asked, please feel free to share. Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sally, and thank you, Gaudens. First, Gaudens, I'd like to, to let you know that uh, Trace Kenya has a close partner in, in Rwanda, uh, Pax Press. Uh, so you may visit there and you'll find two of our colleagues working there. But over to your question, you asked specifically about children or particularly girls with disabilities and how they are really at higher risk of uh, trafficking. That's pretty true. And our experience in, in, uh, in the coastal region and in Kenya in general is that uh, these children are usually, besides being victims of uh, sexual exploitation because they are unable to, you know, to call their personal agency and uh, they, they are totally, they're in many cases dependent on other people they then become victims of uh, sexual exploitation, uh, particular defilement for the girls. Uh, in, in our case, we also see a different form of, of trafficking, that is uh, trafficking for forced uh, begging on the street. And we do have children, others from neighboring countries coming into our cities, and then they are then made uh, 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 to, to beg on the street on behalf of their handlers. So it is true that, that that's a challenge and it's a problem that is, is um, currently dealing with. But this is how we're dealing with it uh, in, in our setup. 
uh, the first way we 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 work with our, our anti-human trafficking and child protection unit. This is a specialized police unit to try and identify those who bring those children to our country and those who then send those children to the streets for begging. And we then seek to arrest these perpetrators and remove uh, the children from the street and into uh, safe houses or, uh, or safety, safe spaces. Mm -hmm. And then we're able to then repatriate them back home. This, this is just what you've been doing. But the truth of the matter is that it's, it's a very big, it's a humongous uh, challenge because, again, our context is such that uh, giving alms to street beggars is considered a, a cultural, uh, of cultural benefit to a lot of people because of religious concern. And therefore, it, in many ways, undermines the efforts that I've just mentioned. So that's our contribution for now. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, any other panelists who would like to respond to that, those that have experience in working with um, uh, children with disabilities? Um, yeah, uh, thank you, moderator. Thank you, Gaudens, for the question. Uh, it's a tricky question, uh, especially considering the fact that uh, in our regions and countries, our governments will always complain about the resources. Okay, they always complain about uh, resources all the times. And so for them, it is always hard to come up with uh, specific materials that could be used for specific groups of people. Uh, for example, uh, those with uh, visual impairment. Um, but here in Malawi, as people saving girls at risk, uh, we are also collaborating and working together with the, the other national organizations, uh, community-based organizations um, <clears throat> that um, work with the uh, specifically uh, different groups uh, of people uh, with different forms of uh, disabilities. For example, the Malawi Network Against the Blind uh, and others uh, to try to reach out to them, to work together uh, so much so that when we talk about these laws and policies, uh, they understand what they are. And in the process, they can go back and filter down uh, to the groups uh, that they are working with. So uh, that's what the, the piece of work that I can confidently talk about. Um, but production of materials specifically designed uh, for those with uh, uh, visual uh, impairment uh, or hearing difficulties, no, not, not, not from what I know. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, Eunice, did you like? Did did you want to respond as well? Yes. Okay. Kindly uh, proceed. For us, like, for us at Life Bloom, what we have been doing, we have been working in partnership with organizations that also work directly with the people living with disabilities. And through that, we have been able now even to uh, include the, the 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 girls and the, the women living with these different disabilities, even in our some of our programs. And we customize the programs based on their on their needs and based on them how they can be able to to be impacted as well. Also, it through working with referrals to specialized uh, shelters for them that uh, have different abilities and ensuring the, P, the people living with disabilities are actively included and involved in the programs. And the other thing that you would encourage is also, we, we are yet there, but we are working towards fostering strong community networks through the community mentors, the, the, the Nyumbakumi. There is something, an initiative in Kenya that is called the Nyumbakumi, the, the, through the local administration where they are they they, they like they do more of community policing and they can be able to raise such issues when they arise thank you thank you so much Eunice um there's another qu question in uh the chat box Dennis would you like to contribute um and speak to your question Dennis Ratemo Are you able to, or I can support and read your question from my end? I just didn't no, want think, to speak. No, yes, I think Dennis, I'm able to. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. I've been given the mic. So thank you so much for the panelists. A very good information on the working approaches. Um, one of the things that uh, recently we conducted a study 
um, along the Kenya Ethiopia border on uh, trafficking. And one of the things that you were trying to test is uh, the potential of um, survivors of trafficking of any nature, could be trafficking of sexual exploitation labor, becoming traffickers themselves. And actually, there are some um, um, valid reasons that were given uh, of that potential nexus of someone transforming from a potential survivor of trafficking to becoming a trafficker themselves. I don't know from the experience of the um, uh, organizations that I've shared here today, whether there is anyone who's doing work around that and whether there are any proven approaches to uh, preventing survivors from transform whatever you're transforming into, into traffickers. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, our panelists and uh, Silke, Eunice, Paul, and Caleb, would you have any experience or are you doing any work around that? Um, kindly proceed to share, Silke. I can see you're on. Um, I will look for a publication that we've done, um, like where, where victims actually uh, are, 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 are charged as traffickers. And I think the answer, as usually, would be protection and assistance, uh, like early referral opportunities um, to really, because normally it would happen out of lack of opportunities. That's that's what we've seen, uh, and the continued threat. Um, so it's 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 a, it's probably a fine line to say whether these are still victims of trafficking or former victims of trafficking, and then also of course uh, the application maybe of the of the non punishment clause. Um, I guess this would be the strongest means um, to to prevent uh, victims of trafficking becoming traffickers themselves. Uh, so, uh, so a really strong, strong support from the outset, um, identification as victims of trafficking, so that they can actually access um, support and 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 assistance and protection. Thanks. Thank you, Silke. Any other panelists who would like to take that and respond? Um, I, I don't know moderator whether I will be contributing directly to uh, the question, um, but I, I, I got the question quite right. And uh, uh, the question Dennis is asking is very varied. Um, in any case, uh, the survivors, the victims, the survivors, uh, everyone that we are working with, uh, we try to take them uh, to understand uh, what trafficking is. Uh, what are the uh, the dangers, uh, the laws uh, that these people are violating, and um, why it is always important uh, that uh, traffickers must account for for their actions. And so, I think in the course of that, uh, in the course of working with survivors like those, the victims, as as they are understanding the penalties. Uh, that they may be there. Um, I really have not come across any one of them uh, wanting to be uh, traffickers uh, themselves because they will understand it's it's a contravention of the laws and they're going to be held to account uh, for their actions. And once caught and taken successfully through the courts uh, of law, uh, the penalties are still high. So I have not come across any, um, but I do understand uh, the question and it's it's a very valid question. Um, thank you, Caleb. And thank you, Dennis, for bringing this up. Should uh, your research now be out and open for sharing, please utilize the chat box so that we also learn from your experience and your research and uh, all the partners on the call learn also on how to contribute to your great work. I see Haruna um, on uh, who have also raised in the question. Would you like to speak to your question?
So Haruna said, part of the problem is lack of cooperation between countries. Uh, for example, with the military takeover in Niger, human trafficking was said to have increased by 50%. How do we address this? Um, is there any panelist who would like to take um, this up? And then Cedric also asked you, Caleb, specifically, on are there any specific legislative framework that regulates shelters uh, targeting children from Malawi? So we can start with you, Caleb, while panelists are processing uh, Haruna's question on con context where there is um, military takeover and the role that CSOs can play. Uh, thank you, moderator, and uh, thank you, Cedric, uh, for from Trace Kenya for this specific question to me. Uh, what I do know uh, is that uh, recently, about two years ago, a government of Malawi uh, established the standard operating procedures for handling cases of uh, human trafficking. And that, in part, uh, also talks about uh, shelters, but not exclusively uh, talking about shelter management, uh, but it's something uh, that I think in the course of uh, implementing uh, the standard operating uh, procedures, uh, maybe we can learn from it. Uh, we can learn from the implementation and at a uh, specific interval, uh, review it and possibly come up with exclusive guidelines uh, on, the, on the shelter management. At the moment, I think it's just free for all. So whether you are a child, whether you are an adult survivor, uh, at the moment, I think it would just all of you be bundled uh, in one shelter uh same management uh without distinctions uh because because of the because of the age i don't know i don't know whether i've answered your your question cedric thank you moderator thank you caleb um and then now we move to the context that is surrounding the military takeover in countries such as niger uh, any opportunities around us um, as different actors on promoting state responsibility to prevent and protect women and girls from sex trafficking? Any panelists who would like to take that on? Let yes, me hazard to people. respond to that, to Haruna's question. Um, our our experience has been that uh, whenever two countries have uh, a diametrically opposed view on uh, uh, either a group of uh, smuggled persons of human trafficking, then it it actually does increase the the situation of trafficking in that country. So uh, I'll I'll just give the example of uh, the situation between Kenya and Tanzania, and then Kenya and Ethiopia uh, as an example. And what has been done internally to try and reduce cases of trafficking. For example, between Kenya and uh, Tanzania, uh, any cases of, uh, of um, a non-citizen of Kenya from Tanzania being found in Kenya is treated as at administrative level. It's not criminalized. And therefore, uh, the opportunities for traffickers to say that uh, they can offer safe passage through or into Kenya uh, diminish and that by extension reduces cases of uh, human trafficking. But our situation with the, uh, with the Ethiopia is that individuals who even seek to have their safe passage through Kenya on their way down south, uh, southern Africa, uh, normally they themselves are criminalized and therefore the uh, traffickers thrive on that. You know, they thrive on the fact that it's difficult to go through a certain territory or a country and and therefore making it uh, possible to have more and more people trafficked because they know they'll be, they'll, they'll not face any repercussions for their work or for, for, their, for their activities. And that may be the situation that has recently happened uh, in, in you know the border, or at least in in Niger, uh, following the the change of government there, so it, this this situation does obtain, and uh, perhaps the best way is to have countries uh, uh, cooperate 
because that's the only way that then you reduce cases of uh, trafficking. And then I wish also to respond briefly to Dennis's question. Dennis had asked about um, uh, does a trafficker trans uh, be, uh, does a victim of trafficking, a survivor of trafficking, can they transform into a trafficker? Yes, in many cases it does happen, particularly when it is uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation. Those with lived experiences of sexual exploitation potentially are the ones that then recruit others into that same uh, uh, circumstance of trafficking. We've also seen this within those that are uh, in the exploitative circumstances of migrant work. Uh, then you find that they now become recruiters to the migrant work situation where the the individuals are recruited are then easily uh, turned into uh, victims of trafficking for uh, exploitation in the migrant work routes. So this this does happen. Uh, however, uh, Dennis, we have not had a very systematized way of uh, identifying the, the challenge, but we we've observed that that is a reality that is occurring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. We have a contribution from Sierra Leone, um, where poverty is also driving um, the high rates of trafficking in children as well as women. Um, and Sierra Leone is also among us with the source, the transit and destination country. Uh, so traffickers often recruit victims from rural areas, target them for exploitation in urban centers. So it's speaking to trafficking that is happening in country and targeting also mining sites, uh, similar to some of the context we have learned from. Uh, so it's a serious issue. We hope and pray our government may look into this as well. So the call to action is not for us to continue just being in our hope and prayer, but to take collective action using the opportunities shared today so that we engage uh, with the government so that they begin to address the issue in line with international law that they are part to and regional mechanisms that uh, facilitate and encourages uh, the governments to ensure that they play their part uh, as state actors. Uh, we are now taking our last question, which is speaking to a question around how do people join um, the working groups? So Silke, over to you. There's a question that you've been asking on, you referred to working groups. How does one become part of that? Over to you. Hello. Um, yeah, I put the link to the constructive dialogue. Uh, the process to participate in that uh, would be would be probably similar next year. I mean, what could also be an op option could be uh, because it's a it's a government process. Um, so it's it's uh, limit the constructive uh, the the working group as such is limited to to member states. Um, maybe, however, there is an opportunity to register uh, as part of the delegation uh, and, and be invited through that. But the constructive dialogue, there will be information on our website. Uh, and we have in our office a particular team dealing with that. I could, I could give you the, the email address, actually, of that person. I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, kindly put the email uh, on the chat box. Thank you so much. It's really helps. Okay. So thank you everyone for making time in commemoration for of World Day Against Trafficking in Persons 2024, being co-hosted by Equality Now, Life Bloom Services International, Tres Kenya, People Serving Girls at Risk. And I really want to appreciate our panelists for their contribution. Now allow me to invite Titi. Uh, from Equality Now so that she can um, talk us through the closing remarks. Over to you, Titi. Thanks so much, Sally. I don't think I have anything more to add because you've already thanked our panelists. So just to say once again, you know, so many thanks to our partners, Paul, Caleb, uh, Eunice, and to UNODC, Silke. Thank you so much. Um, I think we've had a really good discussion, seeing what's happening on the ground. 
um, the challenges, but also the good progress that you know uh, CSOs are making on the ground, and to hear as well from UNODC around some of the opportunities um, that we can be part of at the global level. Um, so thank you so much. It's been good to connect um, at Equality Now. You know we're always open to hear as well what's happening in other parts of um, Africa and other parts of the world. Uh, so feel free, you know, to keep in touch if you've got any information to share uh, for possible collaborations. Um, you know, we welcome that as well. Uh, so once again, thanks to everyone and to our team behind the scenes, um, Michelle and Faria. Uh, thank you so much for setting things up for us. Um, thank you. Yeah, and have a good rest of your day and evening. Thank you, Cece, and thanks everyone. Thank it was much. a process. We can all switch on our cameras for those who are able to so that we can do a group photo and gathering and uh, just being in this moment with each other. So Fariha or Tuva, who will be who is covering us in photography, just let me know if all is set and you're OK. I can't see from my end. That will we be can see. Uh, okay. Just a moment. We are oh, waiting. you can see me as well. All right. Mine is on. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It has been a journey of learning and learning. And mostly, thank you for embracing this invitation and call to action. Uh, as we continue from tomorrow onwards, let's continue. We can't unlearn what we have learned today. So it's an invitation for us to pay forward what we have learned and to keep on the work and we celebrate you on the front lines. Thank you. We have come to the end of the webinar. Good day.